The Democratic Party, as I said, that I grew up idolizing is not the Democratic Party of today. It's about leading with humility and with honor versus the Democratic Party, which really for me has become the party of arrogance and entitlement. So I have to ask myself, who am I and what are my values? Perhaps you can tell me if there's any precedent for this. I can't think of one in recent history that is a really big deal. Hello everyone, welcome to this special bonus edition of The Steve Hilton Show. We have a really interesting guest for you who has a big announcement, a fascinating one. Um, it's going to be a great conversation. I'm really looking forward to it. Um, and it is a senator from California, from the state Senate in California. She's joining us now, Senator Marie Alvarado Gill. Uh, senator, it's great to see you today especially because you have a really big announcement and you're doing it right here with us. So over to you. Tell us what you I have do. to say. Well, hello, Steve. I wanted to start out and just let you know that I'm a super fan. I've been listening to your podcast now for a few years and I find myself getting into a very uh, colorful debate as I'm driving home from the Capitol listening to your podcast. So it's uh, it's an honor for me to be on your show today to uh, talk about something that's very personal to me and is important to Californians, not only across my district, but across the state. And tell us what that is. I should point out that uh, if someone looked you up on the uh, state Senate website or in any other place, um, and they would say, well, who is this senator? And uh, they look up your district and your party. There is a D after your name. There Democrat. sure is. There so is. tell us, but that's changing. So tell us what's happening. <laughs> Yes. So uh, I've been a Democrat uh, for as long as I can remember. I voted first when I was 18 um, a while ago, and um, I have reflected on this uh, for quite some time. I've served now in the Senate for two years. This is my first position in elected office. I represent a district that is dynamic, diverse, amazing. Um, it's the part of California that I grew up in. And it's the part of California that I love, Senate District 4, which encompasses the eastern side of California, very rural, rich in resources, and really uh, personifies um, the uh, American values. And uh, in the past two years that I've been working in the Senate, I have not recognized the, the party that I belong to. The Democratic Party is not the party that I uh, signed up for decades ago. Um, this is not the the party that um, I uh, believed would take us into the direction of California of of making sure we lift up the middle class and um, right. we move in the direction that our kids can have that California dream that we as parents have sacrificed so much. Um, so I came to the realization after much reflection and um, prayer. Uh, that it is time for me to give up that D and to cross over to join my colleagues in the Republican caucus here in California. Wow. That is a very big announcement. And I've got to say very, very unusual in California. I, I don't know my history. Um, perhaps you can tell me if there's any precedent for this. Um, so I can't think of one in recent history. It is a really big deal. Yeah, we don't think that this has been done before. We think it should be done more often. Um, but as you can imagine, um, it's not a, a very popular uh, decision to leave a supermajority party uh, where perhaps, you know, you have a lot more power and ability to, to engage in, in the political environment um, to a, a party that uh, right now is in the mi minority. Um, so, you know, I certainly have taken that into account. But this is a mm -hmm. not only a personal decision, but this is a decision that is right for the constituents that voted me into office. And mm -hmm. I came into this uh, two years ago uh, because my first grandchild was born. And I, um, you know, between my husband and I, we raised six kids. And I'll tell you something. Wow, congratulations. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, not a single one of them can afford to live in California on their own. So, yeah, this is it. Yeah. You know, and, and this isn't anything new. Um, and, you know, I'll say, you know, both my husband and I have, have uh, great careers, um, first in our family to kind of pull ourselves up from the bootstraps, um, go to school, get a great job. And, you know, the California dream for us was, you know, make great decisions, get a good job, buy your first house, raise your family. And I'm seeing that the generations uh, after us are 
looking at that California dream and saying, this is not a place that I can raise my family. So the concept of me not being able to see my grandson grow up in California in the state that I was born and that I've been raised in, um, you know, I've done all my work here just as my constituents have, right? And it's not that we can roll up our farms and our businesses and take our family with us and make that decision to leave California. So the decision for me to stay and fight with a party that is truly looking to fix California, because I'll tell you, if the Democratic Party really wanted to make the changes, they would have done it. They've having the supermajority, having the position um, in the executive branch, right. having the the resources. There really is no excuse for it other than not having the political will. Yeah, I've had a front row seat to this, and and you know this because again, I've been listening to your podcast for quite some time, and and your listeners have given you that testimony over and over again. Um, so so uh, as as a witness, I'm here saying, I've seen it. I've tried this uphill battle for two years, having a seat at the table, and the reality is, California is in a worse situation than when I was elected two years ago than we are right now. It's amazing. Um, there's so many things. I've, I've got to tell you, I really have, you know, I'm my, my, I have the sort of shivers listening to you because what you're saying is, I mean, I'm not kidding, almost word for word, right. the things that I say is I'm on the road up and down California speaking to audiences of all kinds, different groups, some of them political, some of them less political. And one of the things I say, particularly to Republican audiences, when, you know, a big focus area for me in terms of policy and my organization, Golden Together, is housing. It's the first issue we looked at, um, home ownership and that dream of owning your own home. And a lot of Republicans haven't been particularly focused on that issue, to be honest. And they and a lot of them say, why are you talking about housing? And I said, it's for human reasons. And I literally say what you've just said, which is that it's the number one reason people are leaving the state right. and it breaks up families because when children can't raise a family in California, they have to move to another state. That means grandparents can't see their grandchildren. I, I say that all the time. Right. And that's when people start to realize that actually it's a really big deal. I've got so many questions. Okay. Um, I want to get into some of the policy areas and so on, but I actually, I'm really interested because this is such an unusual thing and it's not the normal kind of conversation we have on this show. I'm actually really interested in the, the personal aspect in terms of how it felt, how it feels for you. I mean, this is very new. We, we're actually recording this on Wednesday before the announcement. So the world will know by the time they watch this, but at this point, the world doesn't know. Um, how, how does it feel? It must be very nerve wracking. I mean, you've got a lot of relationships, I'm assuming, on the with with your colleagues, former colleagues in the Democrat Party, still colleagues in the legislature. Um, how does it feel? Right. Um, it, it feels like the right thing to do. And, you know, I'm I'm no stranger to doing the right thing. Um, you know, I've I've continued to to lead with my values and have brought my worlds of experience into the way that I represent my district. And for me, this is the right thing for California because I know I'm not the only one that thinks this way. I know I'm not the only former Democrat that wants California to move in a better direction for our families, for our businesses, um, for our Californians. And to stand up and say what the Democratic Party is doing is wrong and to own that sentence and own that and make such a bold decision to leave the party. And this isn't to leave the party as an independent. This is to leave the party, to join a party that has the formula to fix California. And actually, again, the, the other thing I was, I was so, you know, excited to hear you say, because it's, again, the, the part of my, you know, remarks at almost every event, right. which is that restoring the California dream, it's not complicated. It's not even ideological. It's very practical, common sense things. What do we right. do so people can have a good job that's enough to provide for their family, to own their own home in a safe neighborhood, send their kids to a good school so they have the kind of education that allows them to have a better life right. than they had. I mean, that's that's what people want. That's, that's um, simple as that. So let's just talk about public ed education for a moment here. And it's no secret, California is one of the worst performing public education systems in the country. And we boast our economy of being the fourth or fifth, depending on who you ask, strongest economy in the world. Yet, when we look at how we treat our kids, some of the most 
vulnerable of our society, our public education system continues to fail them over and over and over again. So I actually, uh, before I was in this in this Senate seat, I was in the charter school movement, opening schools for disadvantaged um, communities, um, black and brown communities throughout the Bay Area. And people would ask me, you know, Marie, why why did you choose to work with charter schools when there's such a controversy of being a Democrat um, working with charter schools? And I said, because it's yeah. the right thing to do and because I can do the math. I can read the numbers that we have kids that are being left behind and seeing in them that same image of myself when I was a kid because my, my parents immigrated to the U.S. Um, legally as teenagers with that sacrifice of leaving their family behind, their community behind, all their belongings, their language. Um, my father was a cook um, at Denny's and my mom was a homemaker and did ironing on the side. But they sacrificed that because they wanted my brother and I to have an access to education and a better life than they had. I mean, can you just just imagine right. what 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 goes through our parents' mind to make that decision, right? And you know, I can say yes. You know, my brother and I have had um, you know an uphill battle to get to a, a great place in our life, but the fact of the matter is that there are still kids that look like me that have the story of of immigrant parents, um, first generation, second generation, that are still struggling in just basic math and reading. And we as a state so rich in resources, if that is not a measurement of our failure, then tell me what is. It's unbelievable. I know. And and the thing that's so interesting from a political point of view is that that actually, and this is the opportunity, I think, for Republicans is to really make this point, because actually it's the communities that Democrats traditionally, you know, I, I think that I mean, I'd love to hear your perspective on this from having been inside the party. I think they definitely claim to speak for communities of color, for Latino communities, for black communities, Asian communities. And, but may, but in, when you listen to the, to the rhetoric, it's Latino and black communities, particularly that you hear in the language of Democrats in California. And, and I, to a certain extent, I imagine that they believe it. <laughs> you know, they're not lying when they say that. They really sincerely think that they're helping. But actually, when you look at the results, it's those communities that are hurt the most. That's right where the results are worst. And so tell me about that a little bit. Like, what do you, th what, what do you think's going on inside the party, having been inside and seen it? Why don't things change? I mean, surely they see the results. I mean, it's very, very clear how badly wrong things are going. Right. I mean, it is very clear. And I, I think for me, the knowing things are headed in the wrong direction, but then taking action is a whole other step. And and this is what I'm doing. I'm taking action by leaving the Democratic Party and moving um, towards a, a caucus that I have worked with. Um, these are colleagues that we have partnered on legislation, common sense legislation, public safety legislation. We've gone to, um, to address issues around the fentanyl crisis, the homeless crisis. And again, um, to have a, a, a Democrat in the Senate partnering with Republicans in the Senate on bills and still hitting those brick walls, you have to ask yourself, what is wrong with the system that doesn't see that we are hurting Californians by not promoting some of these uh, public safety bills and education bills? So, for example, you know, people ask me, they say, well, you know, Senator, what was the last straw for you in making this decision? And I was the the first senator to withdraw my name from the retail theft package bills in yes. the Senate that had the poison pill. And never in my life have I seen the type of shenanigans, political shenanigans yeah. that I witnessed here around the Prop 47 um, initiative, um, the governor's intrusion, um, and just the lack of transparency to voters. So that for me was the last straw. And so when you talk about... Um, how we treat black and brown people in California, I think about who are we protecting when we don't allow common sense public safety bills to, yeah. to move through committee? Um, we're protecting an ideology, not the people of California. It is It is exactly right, Yossili. We. It's like we've been you know, talking without knowing it because I say that the whole time. It's so ideological. It's not practical right. what you're getting. When you, I mean, 
were, were there moments in the two years that you were there where you felt really, I mean, you'd have, did you have arguments and would they try and shut you down? I mean, for example, I'm, I'm trying to recall, I think there was an incident where the govern someone in the governor's office did some really punitive action against some, an assembly member that voted the wrong way or wouldn't, you know, they, they, there's a real kind of tendency to bully people who don't fall in line. I've seen, I'm not quite remembering the incident correctly, perhaps you'll remember, but yeah. how, if you try and stand up to it, what happened? Well, I, I will say this. So um, the, the Senate and the Assembly, we kind of have a, a, a similar culture, but very distinct. Um, I will say that I've now uh, been able to serve under two uh, pro tems, um, Senator uh, Meredith Atkins and um, uh, pro tem McGuire now. And I can't say enough good things about both of them. Um, mm -hmm. Their level of integrity and leadership uh, for me, has been such a learning opportunity. And it really is because I see what good leaders are able to do um, is, is moving me in this direction. Um, I've heard the horror stories in the assembly. I've seen it. I've talked to some of my colleagues. I have not experienced that in the Senate. Right. I have been given the ability to speak on behalf of my constituents, vote the, the way that my constituents expect me to vote, um, I have informed myself from both sides of a controversial issue to make sure that when I come to the microphone and put my name on a vote, it is mine. It doesn't belong to the party. And so I feel very good about that. Um, and that's not going to change. So my values are not changing. My approach is not changing. What is changing is the D behind my name. And I'm aligning myself with a party that will continue to move us forward with the will and the solutions that will allow mm -hmm. us to turn California around. Because I'm not leaving. I'm not leaving, Steve. You're going to have to take me out kicking and screaming. <laughs> but I cannot, in good conscience, call myself a Democrat and sit at a table where the meals that I'm being served are not the same that's being served to the progressive left. So we're a fractured party. It's a party that is leading by uh, special interests and not by the will of the people. Yeah, right. I think you've really got to the heart of it there, because particularly when you think of the education issue, it right. feels like that's a really great example of that, where there's this iron grip, it seems, of the, when you talk about special interest, let's be specific, the teacher unions yeah. on policymaking. Um, and you see, and we'll get to housing in a minute. There's a, there's a union aspect to that as well, which most people aren't aware of. But the teacher unions, particularly we saw it in the pandemic, but it's, I mean, in relation to charter schools, I mean, you, you have your background in charter schools. They've, they've made it increasingly difficult for charter schools in the state of California, haven't they? That's right. That's right. And, you know, I raised three kids, too, that had special needs. And I'll tell you, Steve, as an advocate for my own kids, it was very, very difficult for them to get services in public education, which meant that I pulled them out into the non-traditional and helped to actually start charter schools that allowed for kids to be creative and kids to be different um, and for parents to be able to go to work every day and know that their kids are going to be safe, not bullied or ridiculed or even uh, isolated and and kind of uh, stereotyped as unable to learn. Um, so for me, it was it started out as being personal, but I realized that I was not only speaking on behalf of myself and my family as a parent, but I was speaking on behalf of all those other parents that for whatever reason were not able to advocate for what is right and, and what is ethical and moral for their kids. And so I really just took that experience um, into my, my career and um, I haven't wavered on that. I haven't wavered on that with, you know, the the fruits and tomatoes being thrown at me at school board meetings. I've st stood by my values because it's the right thing to do. Um, and I know I'm not alone in this. And so for me, I'm hoping that this courageous step and me coming um, coming on your show and, and making this a public um, kind of transition from Democrat to Republican will allow some of our Californians who are uh, disillusioned, disconnected with either the far far left or the far right that are, mm -hmm. are in that middle. I want them to yeah. know that they have a representative, they have a voice, and the middle class in California deserves to have the agency that we've lost over these last decades with democratic rule. I think it is incredibly important because it gives a permission structure, um, to use the jargon, because, um, and I'd love you to talk about this a little bit, because you hear over and over again, I've heard this for years, actually, but it's been building. There's more and more people say this to me. 
I mean, I'm here in the Bay Area, very, very democratic area. Lots of people, um, increasing numbers, actually, just saying, yeah, we, we need a change. We need a change. This can't go on like this. But I'm not sure I can, you know, I'm not, I'm not sure about saying I'm going to vote Republican or be a Republican. And so one thing you hear all the time is that the, if you like, the, I mean, you talk about D and R, the R against your name as a candidate, the brand Republican in California, that there's something off-putting about that that's holding people back. Because I do get the sense, and I think some of the polling data shows it as well, which is that, I mean, certainly there's a majority who think the state's going in the wrong direction. I believe it's in the 60% now, 60 right. plus percent, think the state's going in the wrong direction. But there's this question of, well, can I go all the way and say, yeah, I'm going to vote Republican. So you doing this, I think is very, very powerful. But could you just speak to that um, issue of the Republican brand and, and how it's seen here in California, what the components of that might be and what the party, what the Republican Party could or should do to change that. Right, right. Well, I'll just start by saying that. So I, I grew up in Mountain View. I grew up in, in the Bay Area. Um, you know, I still remember the the little house that we had. I had the, the porch and the sidecar and the dog. And we had acres of apricot trees and cherry trees. And oh, that, apricots, that, yeah. You remember that, right? And I don't remember. I've seen pictures, but I mean, I can't imagine now, but it's a, right. that's right. That's the history of, the, of a lot of what's now Silicon Valley. That's right. That's right. And like slowly but surely, my family went moving, you know, farther north and now farther east in California. But there was a time in California, and I remember this because I remember the um, personification of being a Reagan Democrat. And I remember that that as a young person, having so much hope and love for my state um, and not imagining living anywhere else, right? And things have changed. Um, the, the Democratic Party, as I said, that I grew up in, in idolizing is not the Democratic Party of today. And when I think about our, our um, Republican Republicans in California, we are very different than the national Republicans. Um, but we do know yes. that the rhetoric at the national level tends to permeate here at the state level. So I, um, I, I fall back on the colleagues that I've worked with side by side for years now here in the Senate and the Assembly. And the amount of work that we've been able to accomplish together is phenomenal. Um, the conversations are authentic. Um, they are true to representing our constituents and, and being public servants, um, not servants to a party or to an ideology or even to special interests. It's about the people. And it's about um, leading with humility and with honor versus the Democratic Party, which really, for me, has become the party of arrogance and entitlement. So I have to ask myself, who am I and what are my values? And for me, the decision was very clear. Now, um, as you mentioned, we're recording before uh, kind of the, the big announcement here. And we know we're going to get some feedback. We're going to get some comments. My social <laughs> media is going to blow up. You know, we'll, we'll have some, some, uh, some rhetoric there to see. But this, this is going to be a healthy debate. This is going to be a healthy conversation because we are going to hear first and foremost what is it that the Republican Party needs to do to speak to Californians who are disconnected and disenfranchised? And the first thing that I'm going to say here is I want to lead in the messaging around celebrating a diverse California. Yes. Right. A California that brings ideas and businesses and, and culture and tradition to California, because that is the richness of our state. And we need to allow that to be an asset of California and not a point of division. And I say this, you know, I, I, I went to public school and, you know, I'm not, a, I was never a math major, but I know that multiplication and addition is stronger than division and subtraction. And that's what I want for the Republican Party that I'm going yes. to be part of in leading in this message. Well, let me say amen to that. That is exactly, you know, what, what, what I believe and, and what I think is happening, actually. I see it. And, and, and that's the message that, that I'm out there giving, and 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 you think that well, that's the, that's California. I mean, that's what's so wonderful about California. There's a phrase that I use all the time. Um, if anyone's listening and they've heard me at one of the events that I've been doing up and down the state, you'll you'll know what I'm going to say because I pretty much finish every event with it. Um, which which is why it's so special that we fight. Why it's so important that we fight for California because it's special. It's something. It's bigger than actually for our communities and our future here. 
as individuals and families and neighbors and friends, it's actually bigger than that because California means more than that. And the phrase that I read, it's not my phrase, I read it in a book um, last year, is California means to America what America means to the world. That's right. And the reason I mentioned that at this point is that if we think of America as this amazing, you know, the shining city on a hill, the place that, that is just the inspiration to the world where anyone can come as your parents did and I, my, I did with my family and become an American. Right. Um, which can't happen anywhere else. It's only this country you can do that. Um, and if that's America, that that phrase, California means to America what America means to the world, is that California should be absolutely the ultimate expression of that, like the best expression of what it means to be American. In other words, that idea of people coming here to follow their dream, and we welcome everyone who wants to do it and, and be a, a, a strong part of the community and, and support that dream for others, I think that's exactly right. And now that we have, I mean, you look at the demographics of California, bring it back right. to the sort of facts of, of where we are. I make this point the whole time. Latinos are now the largest demographic group, 40% of right. California. The breakdown for those who, who like numbers, 40% Latino, 35% white, 15% Asian, 5% black, 5% native. And there's an others that, that go into that category. So that's the future of California. I mean, my organization, Golden Together, we just sponsored a report with Chapman University. Uh, the title of the report, El Futuro es Latino. The future is Latino. That is true. And because the numbers are there. And that's a great thing um, that we should celebrate. And so I totally agree with you about that. And the thing that unites us should be this idea of the California dream. That's right. That's right. The 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 indicator there is should, right? Should. And and you would think that a supermajority that has the power and the resources and the numbers will. So the question is, why not? And why haven't they? And so I, I don't want to serve another two years um, of my four year yeah. term asking that question. It's 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 time to to take take the the bull by the horns, if you will. Right. And and um, and, and get off the ride that just keeps bucking you off. <laughs> Very good. And so how's so have you been kind of inching your way towards this? Have you been having you know, like little sort of private conversations and winking at, at your, you know, Republicans and saying, you know, just hang on a few weeks or has, you know, how's, how's the process been? Is yeah. I guess is what I'm yeah. No, no winking happening over here. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I've, my husband and I, we, we took our, our little vacation uh, last week, um, you know, uh, serving in public office, you know, takes a toll on, on a relationship. We don't see each other that often. I, I do drive home every day, uh, come to the Capitol every day. Um, and, you know, we, we talk a lot about what happens at, in, in the Capitol and, and, you know, kind of the backstage uh, prep on, on different things. And, you know, he was the one that, that inspired me to run for office to begin with. Um, and he has been that, that person behind me saying, you know, you need to question whether or not you are aligned with the ideologies of the Democratic Party and if you're truly serving your constituents. So I want to mm -hmm. thank him for being that support uh, in, in my life. Um, and last week, it's I said to him, I'm, I'm going for it. We're making that decision. So uh, wow. coming back to Sacramento, as you know, we were back in session this week, right? Yeah. Um, and so, you know, I, I believe in transparency. I've had um, some courtesy conversations with my uh, leadership on my team, my chief of staff, uh -huh. my press secretary, my district director, wanting to make sure that they know that this is a, a decision and why I'm making this decision. Um, I don't want there to be any surprises. You know, this is a team that stuck with me for, for quite some time. Um, you know, I mentioned to you uh, the pro Tem McGuire, who has uh, I've, I've known for a, a few decades now. Um, he saw me raise my kids um, back in a district where he was the county supervisor. Um, and I had this conversation with him as well. And, um, you know, that's integrity. That is the integrity and, and respect um, that I uh, I treat others with. And, you know, oftentimes in politics, you don't see that that often, right? It's like, you know, the, the backstabbing and the, you know, underskirting, mm -hmm. right? Um, but again, you know, I, I feel good about leading with my values. I feel good in being able to um, look at myself in the mirror and say that this is a decision that is the right decision for my family, for my district, and for California, the state that I love, and I will continue to fight for. 
And what about the what about your constituents in the district? So, I mean, what would you say? To, I mean, I guess you will be yeah. seeing them. They'll say, OK, I guess prepare your answer, which is, <laughs> well, hang on a second. We voted for you as a Democrat yeah. and now you're turning around as a Republican. How does that work? It's not fair. We need a new election. You know, yeah, yeah. just address those sorts of arguments. Well, you know, my my election was a very interesting election. So um, I actually was able to get on the ballot as part of the open primary system that you know has been in California for about 10 years. So I was uh, one of two Democrats running for this seat in Senate District 4, and we had six Republicans that were vying for this seat. It was an open seat after redistricting. Mm -hmm. And so um, I, you know, I was uh, moving for that second seat number two to uh, be able to go up against a Republican in the general, knowing that yes. my district is leans more center right. Um, we have a yes. higher percentage of Republican voters in our district than we do Democrats. Um, oh. Yeah, yeah, very interesting. Um, and much to my chagrin, it turned out to be a dem on dem uh, general race. Oh, because there were so many Republicans, That's they right. divided it up. That's Got right. Okay. So I will tell you, um, my my constituents have been um, kind of shaken up for the past two years, right? Um, but you know, bottom line is, I have served them since day one. Um, I have brought yeah. the, their voices to the Capitol and I have have earned that respect and that trust um, to be able to go into their living rooms, into their businesses, to be welcomed um, as their senator, not as a Democrat, but as their senator. And um, that is not going to change. My commitment to my constituents is not going to change. And ultimately, you know, I trust in the democratic process and mm -hmm. um, we will see in 2026 um, if my Republican uh, voters, my Democratic voters, my no party preferences um, want me mm -hmm. to continue to serve them. And I would do that with honor. And by the way, I should say, you know, for those who, who you know, may be outside California listening or haven't followed it closely, these Senate districts, they're enormous. I mean, they really are. You have a lot. Just tell us a little bit about that. I mean, how many people do you represent and some of the counties? Because they're really big. Right. So I'm uh, north of about a million. I, I represent the east side of California. And everybody says, there's no eastern California. There's only north and south. And I said, well, actually, there is. So the eastern backbone of California is from the Tahoe Basin. So I have Truckee and the whole uh, basin there. All of beautiful El Dorado County, which is right here next to the capital, um, down the back into Death Valley, Inyo, Mono County, which has some of the bo most beautiful backcountry um, yeah. motorcycle routes that you can imagine. And then the very fruitful Central Valley. I have all of uh, Stanislaus County, uh, east of the 90, Highway 99. So it takes me about 12 hours to drive my district in, in a loop. I pack for all weather. So I have the highest point in the district in California, uh, Mount Whitney, and the lowest point, yeah. uh, uh, Badwater Basin. Um, all different types of climate. Um, we have the richest resources in terms of our snowpack, our water, um, above ground water storage, our uh, aqueducts. And we feed 80% of the food that comes out of California comes out of um, the Central Valley and our district. So, um, so which county, which Central Valley counties do you have? Uh, Stanislaus, Mariposa, Tuolumne. I have the eastern side of Madeira, Merced, and I go all the way into the eastern Sierra wow. and the northern Sierra. I know it well. You must overlap quite a bit with Kevin Kiley. I do. So I have three three congressmen in, in, that I overlap with: Kevin Kiley, John Duarte, and um, Tom McClintock. They're all great. Um, very different, but all great. They are um, very different. Yes, uh, and I have six assembly members that are embedded in my Senate district. Um, and they're all Republican, and we've been working very closely on um, on legislation, um, both the Assembly and in the Senate. And you know, we we have this uh, we floor jockey each other's bills, um, and they've moved my bills in in the Assembly, and I've moved their bills in, in the Senate. Um, so these are working relationships. These are partnerships that have been uh, building for for a few years. Um, as a Democrat, and I just as I said, I. Um, I can only imagine uh, the work that we were, we are going to be able to do now um, being in the same party. So can I ask you a, just a couple more questions and um, going back to the sort of real structural political question. Uh, one of the things that you hear, and it's really flowing from the, your, your point about the top two system. So since that was introduced, one of the things that you hear is, is that the top two, the idea behind the top two system was to promote moderate you know, moderation in politics, people have to appeal to the middle and so on. And it seems like that really hasn't been, the, if you look at the overall picture, right. that hasn't been how it's worked out. And one of the other things you hear is that this will encourage 
you know, the, and, and you hear this from a lot of the business organizations, well, you know, Republicans can't win in California, so you have to support, inverted commas, moderate Democrats. Um, what do you think of that, that concept of moderate, you know, moderate Democrats, the idea that, that the top two would promote centrism? Yeah. Doesn't seem to be working out. Well, you know, maybe I'm the outlier because I have, you know, consistently been in that kind of uh, center right position. Um, you know, we have quite a few outlets, media outlets that uh, consistently analyze our votes and put report cards out there. Right. Um, I will say that um, I was voted the most dismal Democrat in history. <laughs> by the environmentalists. And, you know, at, at first I kind of took offense of that because, you know, we have some of the strongest environmentalists in Senate District 4 and our farmers, our ranchers, our agriculturists, our, yes. our, our water boards. Um, but, you know, it, it just, it speaks to the symptom of the illness here in Sacramento in that we we only see issues through a certain lens and it's that, that, yeah. that majority party lens. Um, so I, got a 1% and, you know, I, I don't believe in participation trophies. Um, so I was very colorful in my language. Um, my team said I couldn't, uh, I couldn't put it in print, but in so many words, take back your 1%. I want a perfect. <laughs> so, um, but you know, it, it takes courage to be able to be, um, you know, criticized for the way that you represent your district, um, knowing that you're doing the right thing, your district is thriving, um, but that certain interest groups don't align with the way that you vote and, and believe that certain bills have more merit than other bills. But the reality is this, California is such a diverse ecosystem that until we acknowledge that our rural communities, our Sierra communities, the places where we, yep. we, we camp and vacation and attract worldwide tourism, until we give agency to the rural parts of California and not just look at voter density, density we're going to continue down this symptomatic um, avenue of keeping California sick. And that is yes. what I am fighting against, um, bringing awareness that uh, if we consistently give the power to the Bay Area, Los Angeles, and San Diego, independent of the rest of the state of California, which controls the water, the food, exactly, uh, you know, the forestry, our our tourism market. I mean, it, for me, it's common sense, um, and I and I beat this drum a lot, but. You'll see in legislation, I work diligently to make sure that that we underscore that the rural communities have access to resources, that rural communities can mm -hmm. compete for grants, that rural communities have a voice in some of these one size fits all policies that come across my desk. Um, so that's not going to change. That's going to continue. You're going to continue to see that. Um, but um, as a Republican. You see, I, I, I again totally agree with all of that. And that's a lot of those issues I've been working on. I, I spend a lot of time in your district, I now realize. Yeah. Um, and, um, and the thing is that, I mean, specifically on that, that question of environmentalism, that we, we've ended up with a very, very narrow and ideological definition of environmentalism, which is basically just a narrow lens of not even just climate change, but like CO2 emissions. And, and that's it, right? And I always say I'm an environmentalist, very much so, a strong environmentalist, but I don't think we need this climate extremism, which is actually forcing us into very, very counterproductive policies that actually hurt the environment in the end. So for me, it's the policies that we are putting in as mandates. And my district talks about this a lot in terms of electrification of vehicles. Uh, and the reality is we are great at feeding the world. We are great at lifting up the economic um, prosperity of California when it comes to food and agriculture. And we want to continue to do that. And we cannot do that if we are looking at creating a, a Bay Area market in the Central Valley and, and asking our agricultural businesses and our ranchers to step up to a model that our state is not even equipped to be able to respond to. Um, I've visited different countries that say, what is happening in California? Yeah. One, they ask me what is happening with homelessness. And then they ask me, how are the businesses surviving with all these mandates around electrification and all these mandates about meeting certain climate goals that the reality is we're not even prepared to achieve ourselves? I know it's crazy. Well, I know we can have lots of conversations about that. If people, by the way, interested in digging into some of those issues, um, we, from Golden Together, my organization, the latest policy report we published is called Water Abundance, highly relevant to all the uh, the great farmers 
in your district. Right. Last question, Marie. I just wanted to ask you, you know, really, again, going back to, because it's a momentous thing you're doing here. I mean, you're speaking so calmly and and um, with such grace about this, um, which is wonderful to see. But, you know, this is a really big deal. It's a, it's a tumultuous thing. Um, and I'm sure the effects will will, be, will go out in all sorts of different directions. I think you're showing real leadership here. And it's going to, and that then things always follow on from that um and we'll see we, we should check in and see Thanks. um in a while but just in terms of the you know the, the you know coming to this decision and so on i mean how have you, you said you had good conversations with your democrat colleagues do you think they felt that this was coming did they sense that this was where you were headed do you think that's a that's a pretty good question. Um, I can't pretend to know what they were thinking or what conclusions they draw to. I, I will say this. Um, to defend this seat in 2026 is going to mean uh, millions of dollars um, that, you know, political donors will be more than happy to give, right? This is not what this is about. This is about saying that um, someone who uh, was able to benefit from an open primary someone mm -hmm. who is qualified to serve it as a state senator, someone who chose to put their family aside for these four years to dedicate my life to serving Senate District 4 in California, and someone who is not a career politician looking to step on someone else's shoulders or forehead to, to, to make it, right? I had a job before and I will always have a job afterwards. But this is truly a commitment to that service. And in order for me to to be able to say I was successful in this means I have to check the receipts when I leave this office, whether it's in 2026 or um, in two or three terms after this. And, and that's what I'm preparing to do. And the colleagues that know me, that understand uh, my district and understand the decisions and the votes that I make, I believe will applaud this decision. Um, I think with with all the divisiveness that comes with some of the national po political rhetoric, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna have some um, some criticism as well. Um, I will never stop working for my constituents. I will never stop working to build trust and partnership with them. Um, my team is committed um, in good and bad times. Uh, it, it really feels like this is a, a, a kind of re-energizing our team. Um, that has been from day one um, working alongside with me. Um, I know that we're, we are going to have a opportunity to do some great things and help to inspire more Californians who want to be active and have their voices heard, whether they are in my district or not. This is about California. This is about our state. This is about yes. the future for our family, for your family, for for those who will be here after Senator Alvarado Gill is, you know, in, in history, right? That's what it's about. Um, and so again, you know, humility and honor, um, those are the two things that for me speak Republican in California. And that is what I'm upholding. And that is what leads me in making this decision. Amazing. Well, listen, I'm very, very confident you're going to have a really warm welcome um, in, in the Republican Party, right um, up and down the state. We're all looking forward to seeing you out there um, in all sorts of different forms and, and the work that you'll continue to do for your district and for the whole state in the Senate. You'll do, as, as you've been saying, you do the same work, right. different party. Um, and one that's a better fit for your values. So thank you so much for being with us today, Senator Marie Alvarado Gill, Republican Senator. Thank you. Now we can say it. Um, it's been a great, great pleasure to talk to you. Thank you for sharing your story um, and we'll see you soon. Great. Thank you so much, Steve.